The Bernie fandom and drama go hand in hand hoof and hoof, if you will. When hundreds and thousands of grown adults began to unironically watch and enjoy My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, it experienced an unexpected and explosive boom in popularity and the brony fandom was born. The fandom's been around for so long and has had so many dramas and controversies and just generally wild stuff go down that it's basically impossible to catalog and document it all. So today we're going to catalog and document it all. From bizarre tweets to convention disasters to intense fandom divides to ponies in space, today let's take a look at a curated list of 30 of the most crazy moments in brony history. Before we begin, I just want to give a huge thank you to Prime Gaming for sponsoring this video. So when Prime Gaming reached out to work with me, they said, we want you to look into the history of a game. So here's a mini deep dive into Candy Crush. Originally created in 2011 as a simple browser game called well, Candy Crush developer King saw the success of other games in the mobile market, especially as Facebook began integrating these types of games into its platform. By 2012, Candy Crush had become Candy Crush Saga, a fun and addictive candy matching game with thousands of levels which enraptured and captivated Facebook users around the world. When they weren't setting their relationship status to it's complicated or poking each other, they were most definitely playing Candy Crush and the game currently has well over 2 billion downloads. It's by far one of the most popular apps and games in the world and even to this day it still continues to be enjoyed by thousands of people around the globe. And last but certainly not least, Candy Crush is just one of many games with epic drops available on Prime Gaming. The holidays are a stressful time to say the least and if you want a little bit of a break from the holiday chaos you can hit pause and start playing with Prime Gaming. It's free with your Prime membership and you can get tons of exclusive in-game content like currency, skins, weapons and more for all your favourite games including Valorant, League of Legends, Genshin Impact, Dead by Daylight and of course Candy Crush Saga. Get your hands on the delicious and juicy bundles you know you want to. You can also get free games with Prime Gaming that you can keep forever and a free Twitch subscription for your favorite scr scr screamer? <laughs> for your favorite streamer. <laughs> so hit pause and start playing this holiday season. The link to Prime Gaming is in my description. Thank you so much to Prime Gaming for sponsoring this video and now grab a snack, sit back and get cozy because we're about to dive into 30 of the most crazy moments in brony history. The fifth generation of My Little Pony was created by Lauren Faust and aired on the Hub Network in October of 2010. Though the show was initially aimed at young kids, the strong writing, clever humour and colourful animation captured the hearts and minds of grown-ups around the globe and a huge, dedicated fanbase of adults began to form. The fanbase became known as the Brony Fandom and in terms of sheer scale, virality and full throttle insanity, we haven't really seen anything like it since. This list has a total of 30 entries documenting various interesting, odd and just generally crazy moments in brony history spanning from 2010 when the show first aired all the way to 2019 when the show wrapped up and had its finale. In between those two events were 9 years of fandom insanity and we're going to dive right into it. Now just as a quick disclaimer before we get into things, there are a few things that won't be included on this list. Number 1. Nothing explicit or outright hateful. I'll be honest, the brony fandom had some pretty dark depths and I'm not going to be covering anything actively upsetting or offensive or harmful. Number two, personal scuffles and infighting. Fandoms have drama, I get it, and the brony fandom has had its fair share, but I'm not going to be airing out people's personal disagreements and drama. And number three, there are a few events that I've left out of the list because they would be way too long to include in this video, or there's just too much to cover and I want to make them their own videos in the future. I'd also like to give a huge thank you to the Twitter account at CrazyMLPMoments. They inspired the topic for this video, and several of the entries in the list are taken from submissions on their account. I'll link the account in the description. That being said, feel totally free to leave a comment if I missed anything or if there are any crazy moments in brony history that you want to share that weren't included on the list. Because you know what they say, if you have cursed fandom knowledge you have to share it and make everyone else suffer with you. Now without further ado, let's get into a list of the craziest moments in brony history. Number 1. Pony posting is banned on 4chan. Throughout the course of this video, you're probably going to have the thought pop into your head, Wow, that's really messed up. Why was the Brony fandom like that? And the answer is 4chan. <laughs> it, it's 4chan. <laughs> 4chan's love of My Little Pony started as an ironic thing and kind of an in-joke but quickly turned into a very unironic enjoyment and appreciation for a show that they initially brushed off as just for kids. They went from trashing the show to ironically watching it to joking about how it actually wasn't that bad to having a 3TB hard drive of pony reaction pictures. Once the fanbase was established on the website it took off and grew exponentially. In the early days the fandom basically just was 4chan and they played a huge role in shaping it. Most of the early jokes, memes and trends 
is formed on there from bro hoof to 20% cooler to love and tolerate to the very word bronies. Of course there were many other memes and trends that formed on the site but most of them are horribly offensive so let's not. Now not every 4 channel was enthusiastic about small pastel horses and while it was all fun and games for the bronies, regular users started getting frustrated at the constant flood of references to the show and pony reaction pics and mods are asleep post ponies. The site was infested with bronies and it was time to call pest control. An admin made a post telling bronies that all pony posts had to go on PonyChan, a website specifically for pony posts that was founded by 4chan bronies earlier that year. It was basically a polite way of telling them that My Little Pony was banned from the website and they needed to GTFO. However, perhaps as a show of goodwill, in 2012 the official MLP board was made on 4chan for bronies to post to instead of having to go off site. To this day, pony posting is still banned on 4chan, it's even written as an official rule on the website. Rule for 15 all pony slash brony threads, images, flashes, and avatars belong on MLP. The My Little Pony fandom is truly like an SCP, it has to be put into its own containment area. Number 2, Cupcakes is published. During the early days of the show's existence, the fanbase was primarily made up of kids and tweens who genuinely unironically enjoyed the show, and bronies were kind of on the outskirts, unsure of whether to embrace this new interest. But once they did get involved, there was a huge influx of adult-oriented content. A lot of stories and videos and memes in the fandom were popular purely because they were messed up and adult and NSFW and that was funny because it was a kids show, you know basically just being edgy for the sake of being edgy. One of the earliest well known examples of this is Cupcakes, generally considered to be one of the earliest grimdark fanfics, it was published in February of 2011 just 4 months after the first episode of the show premiered. To sum it up, Cupcakes was an extremely gory horror fanfic about Pinkie Pie torturing Rainbow Dash and making her into cupcakes. It was extremely overwritten in this very goofy dramatic tone and was filled with excessive and often poorly written gore and in the following years it made its way onto many worse My Little Pony fanfics ever lists. But the goal wasn't for it to be well written, it was to be shocking and attention grabbing and since back in those days nothing like this had really been done in the fandom, it definitely was. After it was published on Equestria Daily, it spread like wildfire in the form of memes, fanfics, artwork and even songs. It was a real turning point and from then on the fandom openly embraced and encouraged gore, horror and grimdark content leading to many infamous stories and games including Lunar Games, Story of the Blanks, Rainbow Factory and many more. Number 3, Fallout Equestria is published. Published in April of 2012 and unbelievably finished in December of that same year, Fallout Equestria is a crossover fanfiction between My Little Pony and the Fallout franchise. With a whopping 45 chapters and over 620,000 words, it's considered to be one of the longest self-published works of derivative fiction in existence. Fallout Equestria was so popular that it basically became its own entity with its own huge fanbase who produced tons of art, writing, music and animation based around the story and its original characters. The fanfiction even had numerous print runs producing several hundred physical copies of the various books, some of which are still available to buy today. The explosive popularity of such a seemingly random and niche fanfic was just an early sign of how big the brony fandom would eventually get. Number 4, Lauren Faust leaves the show. Lauren Faust was kind of a god to the My Little Pony fandom. Not only did they draw her as a literal alicorn god nicknamed Faustacorn but she was seen as a huge celebrity and the single most important authority on My Little Pony. Which obviously deserved, Lauren Faust is brilliant and so are all the things she makes but there was definitely a very intense fan culture surrounding her. Which is why fans were so shocked when after the season 1 finale she dropped this bombshell in a deviantart journal, quote, I suppose it's finally time for me to deliver some unfortunate news, I've been uncertain for a little while now about how, when and to be honest whether to announce this news at all. But here it is, I am no longer working on the show. Various circumstances with the production made it increasingly impossible for me to keep up the level of personal creative involvement and control that I had at the start of the series. I don't think I can accurately express how difficult and painful the decision was and still is. When season 2 begins you will see my credit change from executive producer to consulting producer. My involvement in season 2 ultimately does not reach far beyond story conception and scripts, a little more involved in the beginning and a little less towards the end. However, you should be pleased to know that the gaps that I have left are being filled by the same amazing artists, writers and directors who brought you season 1. I'm certain the show will be as entertaining as ever, though perhaps in a slightly different way. That's right, Lauren Faust was leaving the show and to say that fans were flabbergasted would be an understatement. Of course, outlandish and drama filled speculations and theories began flying almost immediately but the general consensus and belief nowadays is that it was simply a matter of creative differences. Namely, Hasbro wanting multiple large changes to the story and the characters 
just for the sake of marketing and toy sales which didn't match with Lauren's original creative vision. And hold on to that thought and remember it for later because it's going to come up again multiple times in this list. During that end of season 1 period going into season 2, the fans were terrified that this was the end of My Little Pony, that the show would at best become a terrible, unfunny, soulless husk and at worst be outright cancelled. Eventually, the outrage and threats to boycott subsided and the show continued on for many years with other creatives at the helm, but the fandom very much felt Lauren's absence. Many feel that the later seasons of the show lack the heart that Lauren brought to it and that it began to lose integrity with obvious toy tie-ins and pandering fan service. It was a big divide within the fandom and while I'm glad that the show continued on and we got all of the seasons that we did, it wouldn't exist without Lauren Faust and all of the brilliant and unique ideas that she brought to it. The fact that she had to leave over apparent creative differences with the company when she was clearly so passionate about it just really sucks. Number 5. The Lyra plush. Alright, this is one of the grosser ones on this list, so let's be brief. In May of 2012, a large custom-made plush of the background pony Lyra Heartstrings was posted to the dealer's den, basically eBay for furries. I can't go into detail because this is YouTube, but I'll just say the plush had a hole sewn in the tail area. That's all I'll say. The plush quickly became a huge meme within the fandom. People were constantly referencing it, making memes of it, and even drawing art of it. The crux of the joke was basically it's funny because it's really messed up, which, as we've discussed, was most of the jokes back in the early days of the fandom. Again, remember that back then 4chan was heavily involved in the fandom and dictated a lot of the trends and humor, so, you know, there's your explanation for why this got so popular. The meme got so big that a lawyer representing Hasbro contacted DeviantArt to have the pictures of the plushies taken down, which they were, and shortly after, the original dealer's den listing was removed as well. Unfortunately for Hasbro, a viral meme is a very hard thing to scrub from the internet, and it's still reposted and shared online to this day. Number 6, Derpy Gate. So the Brony fandom was really, really obsessed with background characters. The fandom was so big that almost every random one-off background pony, originally just intended to fill out crowd scenes, was given their own name, fully fleshed out backstories, and even relationships by the fans. If you asked a Brony who their favourite character was, they often wouldn't reply with Rainbow Dash or Twilight or any of the main six, but instead with DJ Pond 3, Lyra, Colgate, Berry Punch, or my personal favourite as a kid, Fleur de Lis. But perhaps the most beloved of all of the background ponies was Derpy Hooves. She appeared in the very first episode of the show in one of the crowd shots with a scrunched up nose and crossed eyes. Pretty much immediately bronies on 4chan began spreading screen caps around and the cross-eyed pony came to be known as Derpy, full name Derpy Hooves. It later came out that Derpy was actually the result of an animation error. Her face was meant to be hidden in that crowd shot so it wasn't posed properly but due to some last minute changes, it was made visible. The supervising director for the episode thought it was funny and kept it in, and after the overwhelming fan response to the character, he ordered that her eyes be crossed in every episode that she featured in going forward. Lauren Faust herself also loved the character and even drew her for a charity auction. Floods of fan art, headcanons, and even official merch came out of Derpy, making her one of the most popular and beloved characters in the entire fandom. So naturally, when the season 2 episode The Last Roundup came out and Derpy was not only mentioned by name but had an active speaking role, fans lost their shit. I can't show the clip because of copyright, but basically the episode starts with Rainbow Dash setting up a banner when Derpy nearly strikes her with lightning. Rainbow Dash then explicitly refers to her by the name Derpy and tells her to be careful. She replies, I just don't know what went wrong, which would quickly become a common catchphrase within the fandom and be emblazoned across many a t-shirt and meme generator meme. She then continues to clumsily break things while Rainbow Dash scolds her. Now it's important to note that there had already been a few people raising concerns about the character before this point, but the last roundup really brought these concerns concerns into the spotlight. A bunch of people began vocally criticizing the character, the exaggerated voice that she was given and her klutzy, airheaded personality was claimed to be making light of disabilities and the name Derpy was called out as offensive, especially now that it had been officially canonized in the show. The showrunners very quickly caught wind of this brewing discourse and in a move that shocked and outraged the fandom, the last roundup was censored. Rainbow Dash no longer called her Derpy, her eyes were uncrossed and her voice was dubbed over. The name Derpy Derpy was scrubbed from any and all merchandise, most merch including her just didn't include any name at all, but she was occasionally referred to as Bubbles, a reference to her cutie mark, or Muffins, a reference to her affinity for muffins. This split the fandom in two, while some were happy with the changes and thankful towards the showrunners for actually listening to their criticisms, the large majority of the fanbase absolutely rioted. The controversy was dubbed Derpygate and the hashtag Save Derpy was spread around, often attached to petitions or campaigns urging bronies to harass the showrunners into bringing 
bringing the character back. My name is Derpy Hooves. I used to be loved by many. I used to make them laugh and fill their hearts with joy. One day, I finally decided to come out and talk to them. And what happens then? Some of them get angry and call me names. Stupid. <laughs> Offensive. They want my name changed for, or for me to go away forever. I never meant to hurt anyone's feelings. I just don't know what went wrong. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean it. If you weren't there at the time, it's hard to grasp just how popular Derpy was. She had thousands upon thousands of diehard fans and had genuinely become the poster child mascot for the entire fandom. Her cameo in the last roundup symbolized the showrunners acknowledging and shouting out the fandom, so people were pretty upset when that was taken away. There's a lot of divide on this topic. And by that I mean the large majority are still extremely pissed at Hasbro and haven't forgiven them for censoring Derpy which they consider to be a crime against humanity. But on the other hand, I do want to remind everyone of the very important context that a lot of the fandom was made up of 4chan users and that site has a history of being pretty awful towards disabled people. A lot of the hashtag save Derpy movement was just edgy 4chan bronies brigading against the snowflakes for making their children's show about ponies too woke and PC while calling them slurs and encouraging fans to send hate to the show runners and even specific members of the fandom who would criticize the character. Whatever your thoughts on the matter, it's fair to say that there wasn't a lot of loving and tolerating going on during this whole debacle. Number 7, Doctor Who becomes a canonical character. The character appeared in the background of multiple scenes throughout season 1 and as we discussed in the last entry, the early fandom had a real thing for background characters. Because of his hourglass cutie mark and appearance, the pony was named Doctor Hooves, an obvious reference to Doctor Who. Now this name has been a little bit confusing contentious. He was given the official name Time Turner on early merchandise, but some specific merch releases, including the Funko vinyls, did use Dr. Hooves on the packaging. In later merchandise, Time Turner was scrapped and he was officially called Dr. Hooves, but spelled like this to make it less of an obvious reference. In the episode Slice of Life, he's referred to by name for the first time as Doc or the Doctor. And speaking of Slice of Life, um, it's an episode that exists. It was the 100th episode and as such was basically just 25 straight minutes of fan service focusing on all of the fan favorite background characters and making hashtag epic brony references. Some people thought the episode was fun and a really nice nod to the fan base, and other people thought that it was lame trash. <laughs> I wonder which group I fall into. Anyway, in this episode, Dr. Hooves is confirmed to be close friends with Derpy, they talk about time travel, he's confirmed to be interested in science and technology, and he ends up wearing a very familiar looking scarf at the end of the episode. Very subtle, guys. Dr. Hooves slash Time Turner is far from the only reference parody character. There was Gordon Ramsay, the Big Lebowski bowling alley ponies, Breaking Bad, Rick and Morty, Sherlock, and more. But Dr. Hooves was the only explicit parody pony to actually get significant screen time and more multiple speaking roles. Number 8, Twilight Licious. On the 7th of March 2012, Tara Strong, the voice actress behind Twilight Sparkle, posted this tweet. I'm the T to the W-I-L-E-G-H-T and ain't no other pony troll it down like me, I'm Twilight Licious. She then went on to publish a vocal twit recording of the tweet which in turn was made into an animation by Black Griffin. I'm the T to the W-I-L-I-G-H-T and ain't no other pony troll it down like me, I'm Twilight Licious. Truly a relic of a time when the concept of trolling was unironically cool and edgy. This animation went super viral within the fandom, gaining over 4 million views and inspiring tons of other Ponylicious type videos including Pinkylicious, Flutterlicious and Rainbowlicious, though none of the other animations got the official voice actors on board. Number 9, Tara Strong's Unhinged Tweets. Speaking of weird tweets by Tara Strong, that is far from the only one. The voice actress became kinda infamous within the fandom for her bizarre and suggestive tweets, many, many of which were about Twilight Sparkle being naked. How about this shot? Smokin. Warning. Hashtag NSFW totally nude. Hashtag national send a nude day. Best part of traveling without children? Sleeping naked. <laughs> I know, I've been a terrible trolling tease today and I'm sorry. Extreme close up of my butt to make it up to you. I know y'all love me, but if you're gonna eat me, please go butt first. Uh, I know there are a lot of people that just listen to my videos rather than watching them, so for the benefit of those viewers, 
That tweet was about a cake, like an actual cake, okay? Don't take that out of context. Feeling a little bloated today. How many of you can actually fly naked without getting arrested? Me. I know I'm not supposed to post more pics, but I really do look so cute in my bikini. I will never do a naked wrecking ball video, but here's a pic of me with another girl totally nude. These aren't even all of the ones that I found. No, I'm not gonna show you the rest of them. You're welcome. Number 10, a Cantalot wedding alicorn reveal. So after Lauren Faust left the show, fans were worried to say the least. She was seen as the beating heart of the My Little Pony franchise. She wrote the characters and stories that everyone knew and loved, and she wrote them consistently with integrity and heart and love and passion. After she left, bronies feared that the show would lose its heart, that it would jump the shark, that Hasbro would sell out. And those fears were confirmed in the season two finale, a Cantalot wedding part one and two. In the two part episode, Twilight is not only randomly revealed to have a brother called Shining Armor, but he's about to marry Princess Miyamore Cadenza, also known as Princess Cadence, the Alicorn Princess of Love. This was a double shock reveal since Twilight had never been mentioned to have a brother and Celestia and Luna were believed to have been the only Alicorns in the show. Now suddenly Cadence, a pretty pink and purple Alicorn Princess, was introduced as the third royal Alicorn out of nowhere. And if that didn't seem like an obvious choice by marketing execs for a new toy line, the hub launched an enormous royal wedding marketing campaign to advertise the episode. A Cantalot Wedding Part 1 and 2 was set to be a huge toy generator. Hasbro had this big princess wedding castle toy set coming out alongside the episode among many other princess wedding based toy releases so they went absolutely ham on the marketing, even taking out ad space in the New York Times for a mock invitation to the fictional pony wedding. If you couldn't tell, the marketing leaned very heavily on the wedding angle. The real life royal wedding of Kate and William had happened just the year prior so they were really trying to write off the royal princess wedding fever of the previous year. It was a brilliant and extremely profitable campaign for Hasbro that launched the show even further into popularity, but it was an early example of a questionable story decision made for the sake of selling toys an occurrence which would only become more frequent as time went on. In a DeviantArt comment published in February of 2012, Faust wrote, quote, I was very involved with the inception of the story, but I was surprised when I saw Cadence as an alicorn. I don't know who made that decision, but it was after I was no longer working on the show. She also made a post noting that if it were up to her, there would only be two alicorns. This all seems to confirm the theory that Hasbro was taking the show in a more sensational, marketing-driven direction that didn't at all align with Lauren's vision. Now, Kent Cantalot Wedding is generally considered to be a bit of a masterpiece. It's a fantastic finale, the story is ambitious and epic, and the music absolutely slaps. I can never relate to people my age who said that they used to like have their like tween emo moments to like My Chemical Romance and stuff, because I was having mine to this day area. But while it was a great episode and a definite fan favourite, looking back it was kind of an omen of things to come. Put a pin in that because we're going to come back to it later. Number 11, The Island of Equestria Project. The MLP fandom is no stranger to terrible Kickstarter campaigns, in fact this isn't even the only one on this list. The Island of Equestria Project was launched on Indiegogo in July of 2012 and aimed to buy a real life island that they could legally name Equestria. They planned for show accurate statues and monuments to be erected on the Island of Equestria. Their main example was this monument from the show. From the Indiegogo page, quote, the island will be dedicated entirely to the brony phenomenon, and once it is complete, it will be used in every way possible to support the community. As a meeting place, as a getaway, as a convention location. <laughs> Anything from a small boat to a decently sized ferry or ship may be acquired for use in transporting guests to and from the island for community related functions. However, the function of transportation is dependent on both the amount of funds that this campaign receives and the location of the island itself. We have various islands which are up for sale in mind, however, the once selected is entirely dependent on the success of this campaign. The higher, the better. More money will allow for bigger islands, better locations, and better structures on the island. The donation tiers were also just truly incredible. $5 gets you an email containing pictures of the island, but the next cheapest tier is $50 for pictures of the monument, so, you know, what a steal. For $250, you get to go on a three-day campout on the island. For $5,000, you get a week-long campout and a personal tour. And for a whopping $7,500, quote, you will have input on everything 
everything from how the structures look to where we put them on the island. I love that really specific genre of Indiegogo or Kickstarter where you pay them a ton of money to do their job for them. <laughs> the project obviously failed, it had scam written all over it and very few people actually brought into it. I am kind of sad that this didn't happen because I'm almost certain that we would have gotten some kind of castaway type event. Like Lord of the Flies but instead of British children it's chronically online guys with 20% cooler t-shirts and gamer Luna plushes. Number 12, Pinkie Pie Tulpa. Okay so if you don't know what tulpas are there's this idea that you can create independent personalities or beings in your head called tulpas. They're basically like sentient mental companions that you can create using your mind and then they live in your mind with you and can talk to you and they share your body. Now huge disclaimer here, tulpas are a very controversial topic it seems. When I was researching for this video to write this explanation there were all kinds of articles and discussions about whether they're cultural appropriation, whether they're offensive, whether they're dangerous. Um, so just know that I'm not an expert and this explanation was just kind of a brief overview to give you an idea of what they are. If you want to know more about them, Please do your own research. Anyway, after My Little Pony came out, the Tulpa community experienced a huge boom in new adoptees who were asking for advice trying to create their own My Little Pony Tulpas, often for unsavory reasons. One of the most infamous Tulpa stories was actually posted to 4chan by a brony, quote, creating Pinkie Pie Tulpa, do it before going to bed every night, ignore warnings about doing exactly that because it can take ideas from your dreams. 60 hours in, I've started hearing and seeing her, her face is deformed as fuck and frightening and I can't change it. She just keeps yelling for no fucking reason, mostly when someone else is talking to me. Can't hear shit when she does. My face win. The rest of the thread is basically just OP describing how the Pinkie Pie Tulpa terrorizes him by blocking his view, making him feel cold, getting inside his head constantly and screaming, with the other anons replying, well, pretty much like how you'd expect them to. The story is definitely fake, but it's still pretty infamous online. I've actually seen people referencing it even today, and hilariously, most of the time they leave out the context that the Tulpa was a My Little Pony Pinkie Pie Tulpa. <laughs> Number 13, the Twilicorn controversy. Every person who was in the fandom just tensed up when I said that. By season three, the fans had relaxed a bit. The royal wedding Alicorn Princess debacle was behind them, and the show went back to normal with no more surprise toy bait Alicorn Princess reveals. And then the season 3 finale Magical Mystery Kill came out and it happened all over again but with the main character. But let's back up a bit. There were rumours that Twilight was going to become an Alicorn Princess long before the fateful episode even aired. The first leaked image of Twilicorn came from this picture of some people posing with Hasbro's new Furbies, behind them a large My Little Pony poster featuring a winged Twilight. As rumours began to swell, more and more leaked images and merch were found, Twilight plushies with wings, a sticker book containing Alicorn Twilight, and an unreleased Amazon DVD listing with Twilight Sparkle Princess in the description. A tense atmosphere began to settle over the fan him like a thick fog. While some were excited for this potential development, many were emphatically not and they tried to convince themselves that the ever-growing list of leaks was fake or some kind of hoax. And then it happened. On February the 16th of 2013, the season 3 finale Magical Mystery Cure aired and all hell broke loose in the fandom. In this episode, which is an absolute banger of a soundtrack may I add, Twilight accidentally casts a spell on her friends that switches their cutie marks. Chaos ensues as Pinkie Pie struggles to run the farm, Rarity tries to control the weather, Applejack tries to sew dresses, you get the idea. Twilight rushes to find the source of the spell, helps her friends to discover their true selves again, and in the process discovers what friendship truly means. Now here's where the big twist reveal kicks in. After fixing everything and learning about the true meaning of friendship, Twilight is transformed into an alicorn with large feathered wings and a slightly taller stature. Now not only is she an alicorn, but Celestia confirms that she is now an alicorn princess, the princess of friendship. I can't even begin to describe how cataclysmic, how explosive this was within the fandom. The shockwaves that rippled after the release of Magical Mystery Cure were indescribable. Twilight became known as Twilicorn by the fans and the drama was dubbed Alicorn Gate or Princess Gate. It absolutely divided the fandom. In one camp you had the ecstatic Twilicorn stands who absolutely loved Twilight's new powered up princess form and were excited by this new direction for the series. And in the other camp you had the vehement Twilicorn haters. They absolutely despised this new change and heavily criticized the showrunners for the sudden twist which they felt ruined the story and characters. 
I'm really sorry guys, I can't even lie. I was a huge Twi'lekorn hater, like huge. I had never been that mad as a kid and I was a huge proponent of the anti-Twi'lekorn movement. There was fan art criticizing the decision, memes making fun of how lame Princess Twilight was, essay length write-ups on how terrible the writers were, and I joined in on all of it. I'm gonna be honest, a huge part of my hate towards Twi'lekorn was just the fact that I was jealous, I thought the Alicorns were really cool and special, and I was jealous of Twilight. It wasn't really the princess aspect, it was more the wings, I just thought having a horn and wings was super cool and her wings were like bigger than everyone else's and I was just jealous. I, I wanted wings as well. I wanted to be an alicorn but I was just a human child. But putting aside petty haters like myself who were just butthurt that they didn't get cool wings, there were many fans that were disappointed in this decision for more rational reasons. Bronies had already taken issue with the introduction and cash grabby princess wedding tie-in of Cadence and Twilight's ascension had gone down a similar route with Hasbro marketing the quote unquote princess coronation crazy hard with an aggressive campaign of advertising, toys, playsets, and merch. Basically any item you can think of, Hasbro took it and slapped that little purple pony on it and it sold because she had wings now. Lauren Faust herself actually expressed her disdain for the decision on multiple occasions. In one thread of tweets she asked if Funko had ever released a Twilight Sparkle vinyl figure without wings and after someone replied that they didn't, she wrote, Boo. Guess my collection will be incomplete. In response to someone asking how rare alicorns were, she replied, if it was up to me there would only be two. In a reply on DeviantArt she wrote, I said in the doc that I planned for Twilight to be Celestia's successor. I did not use the words alicorn or princess. In response to the floods of bronies contacting her to demand answers about the situation, Faust simply responded that she couldn't comment since she didn't work on the show anymore and any plans she had for the character were quote, now irrelevant. There were many story reasons that fans were upset about Princess Gate as well, namely the fact that it felt like the show's ultimate finale had just been randomly plonked in the very middle of the show. For many fans what bothered them wasn't that Twilight became an alicorn or became the princess of friendship, it's that her main goal throughout the series was to learn about friendship, suddenly making her the literal princess god of friendship magic in season 3 of a 9 season series took away that driving motive and made the show feel kind of pointless or at least directionless. Once your protagonist has reached their goal the stakes are a lot lower and the story loses steam, these problems were exacerbated by how sudden the twist felt rather than the slow build up that viewers were expecting. I'm assuming this is a consequence of the show being at the mercy of a network and not actually knowing how many seasons in total they would get so they weren't really able to plan ahead very far, but it still feels like reading a version of The Lord of the Rings where they throw the ring into Mount Doom about 500 pages in and then just dick around in Mordor for 500 more pages. Fans also noticed that Twilight's flaws, her inability to pick up on social cues, her occasional snarkiness and sarcasm, her dry wit and judgement, all of it seemed to vanish once she became a princess. Obviously with this being the early 2010s, Mary Sue accusations were flying, pun intended, all over the place and while I don't subscribe to the whole Mary Sue label in general, post Ascension Twilight felt a lot more watered down, a bit flatter, just missing some of those flaws that made her character so relatable and fun to watch. Twilight's library was special to her, it fit her character and represented her passion for reading and astrology, it wasn't perfect or fancy but it was cosy and she and her friends loved it. After her Ascension they ended up blowing up Twilight's treehouse library home and replacing it with a giant crystal princess castle which in my opinion was one of the worst most cynical decisions made in the entire show. Even as a kid I remember really hating it, it looked sharp and imposing and out of place in Ponyville and the interior shots made it look cavernous, dark and empty. Actually when I look at the outside in a bunch of the interior shots it reminds me of that post that always goes around about Jerry Seinfeld's apartment and how it's like physically impossible because like the inside and the outside don't match, it looks like really small on the outside but the inside is like a labyrinth of corridors and giant hallways, it's weird. Honestly, in general the design is just plain terrible. The Golden Oak Library was warm and used soft round shapes to appear cozy and inviting. The Friendship Castle is giant and cold and spiky and if you know anything about basic colour and shape theory you know that this doesn't come off as friendly or inviting in the slightest, especially for kids. The new power imbalance in the Friendship was also frequently brought up as an issue. Twilight had always been the unofficial official main character of the show but every pony in the friend group was treated equal and brought their own unique traits to the group. Twilight's sudden transformation into a princess changed this dynamic, it shifted the attention entirely onto her and gave the group this kind of weird main character
character and her friends dynamic that a lot of fans didn't vibe with. It's worth noting that Twilight's friends helped her at every step along the way and arguably were often kinder, more thoughtful and more emotionally intelligent than she was. Which is kind of the point, I mean she did go there to learn and grow but if I was part of that friend group and I contributed to all of the adventures and equally participated in all the lessons and did all this stuff and then only Twilight got made into a cool alicorn princess, I would have some things to say in the group chat. As a kid, I desperately clung on to all the Alicorn Main 6 fan art that came out after this episode because I was convinced that the rest of the show would have the others slowly earn their magic and become Alicorns too. It was just so unfair to me that out of a group of friends only one would become an epic Alicorn princess with cool wings and I refused to believe that they didn't plan for the others to transform as well. But alas, that never happened and to this day, I'm sad about it. Plus this is kind of a cliche thing to add so I'll be brief but alicorns are immortal so by making her an alicorn Celestia actually cursed the princess of friendship into a grim fate where she must watch her friends die over and over until she doesn't have the strength to form relationships anymore. At the end of the series you even see that all of the main six are visibly aged except for princess twilight. Pretty dark honestly. Also no offense but I hate twilight's design in this final episode. She looks like she could beat me up. But to be fair on the other hoof there were plenty of twilicorn supporters. A lot of people just thought Alicorn Twilight was cool as fuck, which is a perfectly valid reason to like something. Some fans found it to be an interesting decision and they liked all of the conflicts and the new dynamic that it brought to the main six and the show in general. Artwork celebrating Twilight's transformation and condemning the haters was made, celebratory posts and stories were written, excited fans theorized about potential new story beats that would spawn from this decision. One of the most popular slogans from this time was I believe M.A. Larson, which was proudly displayed on stickers and pins to show support for the writer who penned the episode who was obviously getting bombarded with hate from all directions. Though Magical Mystery Cure seems to be regarded a lot more positively today, most people I've talked to actually said they really liked Alicorn Twilight and didn't see what the big deal was. It still remains as one of, if not the biggest dramas in the entire fandom and the decision that changed the show forever. It was never quite the same after this. Whether it was specifically Twilight's transformation into a princess or more generally the departure of Lauren Faust that caused this noticeable change of direction in the show show and the subsequent rift it caused between the fans, well it's hard to tell. It was so explosive, so divisive, so impactful that it changed the course of the fandom and even the show itself in countless ways. Whichever side of the fence that you fall in, you can't deny that Hasbro got exactly what they wanted. They wanted the princess coronation to be a big event and boy was it. Number 14, Los Pegasus Unicorn. Los Pegasus Unicorn was an infamously ill-fated brony convention which took place in February of 2013 from the 22nd to the 24th. If you couldn't tell by the name, Las Vegas was the destination of choice for the no-holds-barred convention extravaganza which aimed to topple BronyCon as the largest and most popular pony convention in the world. Yes, that was their goal in their very first year. With a huge star-studded list of guests, convention halls booked out at the beautiful Hotel Riviera right on the strip and tons of artists, vendors, games, activities and performers lined up, it was said to be a convention of epic proportions. But as the convention organizers quickly found out, Rome wasn't built in a day and their high hopes came crashing down when reality hit. Turns out the Hotel Riviera was not only one of the cheaper lower budget hotels on the strip with gambling machines and advertisements for strip shows pasted everywhere, but it had filed for bankruptcy after losing 20 million dollars in the last quarter. This became an issue when Las Pegasus Unicorn failed to meet their really unrealistic attendance goals and realized they wouldn't be able to pay for the hotel they'd booked. And with the Riviera being in such deep debt themselves, they were getting that money come hell or high water. This caused a catastrophic domino effect, they created fake monopoly pony bucks called unicorn bits that looked like this, yes this is real, and asked attendees to use them if they wanted to buy anything at the convention. This was in exchange for their real human money of course. Several VIP guests weren't paid for their appearance at the convention and posted about their disappointment on Twitter implying that they wouldn't be attending any more events. At this point in time My Little Pony conventions were still pretty new and Hasbro was still pretty unsure about them so these tweets alone were enough to be a potential death blow to the very existence of My Little Pony Con. Some guests couldn't even afford to get back home after their checks bounced so several brony media sites banded together to raise money in a dash con style fundraiser in order to get the actors paid so they could actually go home. Due to the lax security, attendees were essentially allowed to roam the premises including off limits areas unsupervised leading to a fire alarm being pulled. 
Everyone in the hotel had to then evacuate and wait outside until the situation was sorted out, which Everfree Network actually caught on film during their coverage of the event. Right there are fire now. alarms going off, and we're going to find out what's going on. Exactly. We're, we're, there Possibly. are fire alarms. They just came on. We're standing outside the autograph session. If you look in there, there's an autograph session going on right now, mm -hmm. and uh, the fire alarms came out. We're, we're right. The lights are flashing. The sirens are going. You want to come going. this way? We'll, let's keep the, the microphone cables going yep. on. We'll, uh, we're heading, we're out. heading out. We're reeling in. We're reeling in. Uh, once again... What? Well, no, no. Let's let's actually go out. <laughs> yeah, let's 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 leave the inferno, please. They just said that no one will let out in the, back to the hotel uh, for, for five minutes. Is that he said five minutes? He said what they're going to do? They're investigating uh, the 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 state nature of the alarm. The alarm. Uh, they are going to try to get everything taken care of as quickly as possible, but nobody is going to be allowed into the building within the next five minutes. So, okay. On Sunday, all of the attendees were kicked out of their rooms, and their bank accounts were charged, allegedly at the request of Lost Pegasus Unicorn itself. At this stage, they were around a hundred and fifty thousand dollars in debt, and so asked the hotel to just charge all of the guest cards for their rooms in order to scrounge up a bit more towards that gargantuan cost. Obviously at this point things are in total shambles with the con staff in full on panic mode and seeing the writing on the wall, vendors went in to cash in their unicorn bits and get the hell out of dodge only to find that management had disappeared. Yeah, the management of the con, a couple of shady characters who I won't get into here but needless to say should not have been running a convention, had done an actual runner. It's alleged that they stole $40,000 in cash from the convention earnings before they fled and following the disastrous event they released a statement essentially claiming that they did nothing wrong wrong. Obviously this version of events has been disputed by attendees who were actually there and saw what happened with their own eyes. Though at the time it was feared that Lost Pegasus Unicorn had spelled the end of My Little Pony conventions forever with many vendors, attendees and guests having been swindled, there was a silver lining. It led to the formation of the European Pony Conventions Union which established a code of guidelines for safe and smoothly running conventions and it served as a pretty effective cautionary tale for other fledgling conventions starting up around the world. Thankfully, following Los Pegasus Unicorn, the convention scene flourished, and since then, no other brony convention has ended in such disaster. I have an entire video on Los Pegasus Unicorn if you want to hear all the nitty gritty details, but the too long didn't read is. If someone offers you unicorn bits for your money, don't accept it. Number 15, Double Rainboom Short Film. The Brony fandom was no stranger to animated shorts and songs on YouTube, from Snowdrop to Smile HD to Lullaby for a Princess, which still makes me tear up whenever I listen to it, don't worry about it, I'm fine. But Double Rainboom was different for a number of reasons. It was slated to be the first ever fan animated episode and it was hyped to holy hell before its release. A full 30 minute fan episode would surely be the stuff of legends, thought the fanbase, so they waited with bated breath for its release. Finally, on March the 30th of 2013, Double Rainbow premiered to a very mixed reception. Despite racking up views in the millions, it was highly contentious, mainly due to its fan servicey writing and the fact that it had a surprise Powerpuff Girls crossover segment halfway through. Discussions quickly went up over whether the short actually lived up to the hype. Quote, the problem is that it's not just bad compared to an actual episode, Double Rainboom was just bad. It had basically no interesting conflict, the writing was bad, the pacing was terrible, the ponies were out of character, the voice acting was mediocre at best, the animation could have been better, and the entire thing was oversaturated with unnecessary references and fandom callouts. They should never have advertised it as an episode, that implies so many things that this did not live up to. Don't get me wrong, I greatly enjoyed it, but I went in without any expectations because I hadn't been paying attention to it at all. If I had gone in expecting a true episode, so I would have been frustrated that it didn't fit the show canon. Now I don't really agree with all of these criticisms, I think that a 30 minute animation in any style is a huge accomplishment and I think the animation style was great, it was fun and bouncy and really entertaining to watch. But unfortunately the animation was called into question for other reasons. A year after Double Rainboom came out it was taken off of YouTube. Rumours of an impending lawsuit began spreading as accusation of asset theft started. A few anonymous sources claimed that despite Double Rainboom having explicit permission from Hasbro they had used leaked DHX rigs and other leaked assets without permission to make the film and Hasbro were planning to take action. However the creator claimed that this wasn't true and they simply wanted to step away from the project and Hasbro never issued any kind of legal action so it's really impossible to know what actually went down. The other reason that Double Rainboom was so controversial is that it was actually a school project. It was the creator's senior film at SCAD or the Savannah College of Art and Design which caused a bit of a hubbub from the few SCAD students I've heard discussing I heard a rumor that after Double Rainbow aired, the school ended up banning any short films based on licensed properties, 
but I could be wrong about that if any SCAD students are watching this, feel free to correct me. Double Rainboom is still available to watch on YouTube via a repost and apparently the creator is actually teaching animation now so good for him. Number 16, Equestria Girls and Flash Sentry. My Little Pony Equestria Girls, released in 2013, was a highly anticipated spin-off movie and doll line tie-in which featured a humanized version of the main cast attending high school. It was also extremely controversial among the fanbase and was accused of being a massive soul cash grab by Hasbro, a boy who could have seen that coming. It was a damn effective cash grab though, with the original movie spawning three more full-length movies, an animated series that ran for three years, six television specials, and a metric butt-ton of dolls. And while, yeah, we could talk about the drama surrounding the release of Equestria Girls and how everyone was up in arms about it and thought that it was just mindless pandering to sell dolls, it's much funnier to talk about the Flash Sentry drama. Flash Sentry was introduced in Equestria Girls as a student at Canterlot High who plays the guitar that Twilight appears to develop a crush on. At the end of the movie, they bump into each other back in the pony world where Flash Sentry is part of the Royal Guard, causing Twilight to blush and her friends to playfully tease her about liking him. Most people just shrug this off as whatever, but to a very small, devoted selection of Twilight obsessives, this could not stand. An intense hatedom began to form around Flash Sentry and the fact that everyone hated him and disliked his character became a common in-joke within the fandom. The most common reasons given were that he was boring and bland, didn't have enough screen time, and was largely pointless, and honestly I agree, to me Flash Sentry felt like a lame attempt to give Twilight a love interest for the sake of having a love interest, cause that's what movies for girls do apparently. It was dumb. But for a lot of bronies, the true reason that they hated him with such a burning passion is that he took away their waifu. Cue tons of weird posts about how Flash Sentry is a Brad or a Chad, that he was a waifu stealer, that he didn't deserve Twilight. It was basically a bunch of angry dudes seething about the fact that a fictional purple horse got a boyfriend, and it was glorious. How can I possibly be mad at discourse that brought us this completely cursed image? Number 17, Lou Reed's final tweet. On the 26th of October 2013, musician Lou Reed posted this My Little Pony meme to his Facebook page. It depicts the cover of his 1975 album Metal Machine Music with Twilight edited onto it. This version of Twilight is from the season 2 episode It's About Time in which Twilight travels back in time to warn herself about the future. She freaks out seeing her future self thinking some huge war is gonna happen but it just turns out that future Twilight looked like that because of a series of everyday mishaps and she was from like a few days in the future and there was nothing to worry about. Despite the silly premise behind it, in the fandom this version of Twilight was frequently used in very serious dystopian and apocalypse stories and alternate universes alongside a bunch of other pretty commonly used apocalypse designs for the rest of the main six. This has nothing to do with the Lou Reed tweet, I just thought it was interesting to mention because these designs used to be literally everywhere. Anyway, literally a day after this was posted on the 27th, Lou Reed passed away, making this My Little Pony meme his very final post to social media. Number 18, Celestia and Luna go to space. On January the 10th of 2014, a Reddit user called Sight Unseen 1337 made a post to the My Little Pony subreddit titled, In about 15 minutes, Princess Luna is lifting off for the ISS. Watch it live. I work for an aerospace contractor and about six months ago I was bored so I added Princess Luna to the silk screen layer of a printed circuit board. Anyway, the device is going up on Orbital Sciences Orb 1 at 12.06 CST. The OP included images of the circuit board which was dark blue and had a white engraving of Princess Luna on it. A year later, in January of 2015, OP made another post, quote, when this post is 30 minutes old, Princess Celestia is blasting off for the ISS. Watch it live. To make a long story short, Celestia is hitching a ride to the ISS on board the SpaceX Dragon CRS-5. The launch is from Cape Canaveral SLC-40 at 3.37 CST. I work for an aerospace company and part of my job is designing printed circuit boards. I was bored so I added Princess Celestia to a project to see if anyone would notice. This lady became the flight revision because it passed testing so the power supply board with Sally on the silk screen is going to to be in a device mounted outside the ISS. Again, the OP included some crisp images of Celestia printed onto the circuit board. Turns out that aerospace isn't the only industry where people are sneaking ponies onto machinery as evidenced by this reply to the post, quote, I work for a precision optics manufacturer and when I'm bored I put stickers or etch things onto our mechanical parts. Somewhere in the National Ignition Facility is a beam focuser with Princess Luna sitting on a cloud etched inside. People like you and I shouldn't be allowed near precision machining equipment 
treatment or else ponies get put in very important places. Honestly, I'm not at all surprised that bronies were so unanimous in the 2010s that the princesses are literally orbiting Earth, but knowing Luna's whole backstory, sending her into space is actually pretty dark. Number 19, Slender Pony. During the late 2000s and especially the early 2010s, Slender Man was a viral phenomenon, appearing in YouTube skits and series, video games as weird bootleg plushies, and yes, in My Little Pony. In the season 4 episode Pinky Apple Pie, Slender Pony appears for a split second behind the tree in one of the shots. It goes by super fast so it's quite hard to see, but screen caps show it more clearly. This is actually still considered to be a myth by a lot of people. I brought it up in my Slender Man video and got a lot of comments saying that it was fake and just a rumour, but no, I've watched the episode and it's really there. A few members of the staff came out to say that they had no idea that it was there, so it was likely placed there by a few storyboarders or animators. Number 20, Dark Skies Dating Sim Scam. So I actually covered this topic in a video from a few years back. You can watch it if you want the full detailed story, but to be honest I wouldn't recommend it because, well look at that delicious crunchy video quality, yum yum. So you don't have to go through the pain and torture of watching that video, let's go over the bizarre story of dark skies here. In March of 2014, a bizarre Kickstarter launched for a brony dating sim called Dark Skies, asking for $7,500 US dollars to make a quote brony dating sim with deep RPG elements, 100 plus gameplay hours, and gorgeous artwork. The red flags were immediately visible. For one, no one had any fucking clue what the game even was. It claimed to be a dating sim but boasted quote deep RPG elements, massive map, hundreds of customization options, 100 plus hours of gameplay, which may I remind you is almost on par with games like Fallout 3, The Witcher 3, and Elden Ring. Compelling and timeless story, nearly endless replay value, and 50 plus ponies. In the stretch goals they promised to add 200 weapons, 50 spells, and 2 new character classes if they got $15,000 over their goal. And then, there was the video. What, what can you even say about the video? I just have to let it speak for itself. What's up, every pony? I go by the handle Psychoactive Charm, and for years I have slaved on other ponies' games. <laughs> I've worked as a storyboard artist, a concept artist, an animator, blah blah blah, you name it, I've probably done it. Now, what's this video all about? Brony, 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 brony dating scene. It's PG-13, and it doesn't matter if you're a guy, a girl, something in between, or something different entirely. Every pony is gonna be able to enjoy this game. Let's meet the ponies of Royal Pony Academy here in Sears City. My name is Pumpkin Pie, and I'm the smartest pony in the whole school. By my calculations, you'll be falling in love with me. The only question is, will I fall in love with you? What do you want? My name's Jet, and if you touch me, you're dead. You think you had it rough? Try growing up without a father. You know, you kind of look like my dad. Maybe I should cut you up just for fun. Um, I'm Trickstar, and you better get away from here, because if the other ponies catch you talking to me, they'll probably make fun of you, because I'm the guy that they always make fun of. I'm Starshine. I guess I'm the type of pony who's always staring off into space, wondering if there's something more waiting for a pony like her. I just know that out there, in the star somewhere, there's a pony for me. Bryce, I'm the captain of the swim team. Uh, if you want to hang out sometime to practice, we can hang out. Just not at my house though, because my parents are like really lame. Hey fellas, I'm Diamond Bright. I'm gonna make this short and simple for you losers. There's only one way to my heart, money. So clearly something was very wrong here, from developer Psychoactive Charm's bizarre cameo in the video, to the unhinged borderline parody voice acting, to the contradictory and purposefully vague description of the gameplay, and oh yeah, the claim that the game was four years in the making despite My Little Pony only coming out three years prior. Rumours and theories began to spread and accusations of scamming were levelled at the project, who responded by making a Kickstarter update claiming to be, quote, the target of a very advanced and sophisticated smear job by patriarchs of the forum known as 4chan.org slash pony. Well it turns out that the truth was even more bizarre than just a plain old scam. It came out that the project was actually the work of Sam Hyde, a controversial internet figure behind multiple viral hoaxes and pranks as well as the short-lived adult swim show Million Dollar Extreme. The entire Dark Skies campaign had been an elaborate ruse to prank bronies into pledging money to a brony dating sim to make them look stupid and prove that they were freaks I guess. 
Vegas. The Kickstarter didn't reach its goal and was cancelled shortly after Hyde was revealed to be the mastermind behind it all. Unfortunately, there were a few casualties along the way as several random people had their pictures stolen and used as fake developer profiles and the artist who drew all of the art for the game had no idea Sam Hyde was behind it and was essentially tricked into working on the project. Interestingly, despite speculation that this was a bit for Million Dollar Extreme or some kind of other secret project that Sam Hyde was working on, it never actually eventuated into anything. Dark Skies is often forgotten when talking about crazy moments in brony history, which is a shame because if an insane brony dating sim Kickstarter scam secretly run by Sam Hyde isn't bonkers, I don't know what is. Number 21, The Rainbow Dash Jar. No. Number 22, Antarctic Snow Shrine. The Antarctic Meteorological Research Center and Automatic Weather Station Program, abbreviated as AMRC and AWS respectively, are United States Antarctic Program projects focusing on meteorological research in Antarctica. On the website for AMRC and AWS, there's a section called On the Ice where researchers can make blog posts about the project and their own experiences, and on January the 19th of 2015, a research intern called Carol Costanza made a post about her own trip. In one section, she shares photos of the ice tunnels that carry water and sewage to and from the station. Within these ice tunnels, there are several shrines for different things set up, including a My Little Pony shrine. It appears to include a map of Equestria, a picture of the show's logo, pictures of the entire cast, a picture of Nurse Red Heart's cutie mark, keep this one in mind because it's going to come up again in a few entries, and a few blind bag figurines. Unfortunately, this plaque is too low quality to read. So yeah, not only have bronies marked their turf in space, but they have claimed Antarctica as well. Number 23, Dim Sum the Dragon. In 2015, this image of a dragon character bearing a striking resemblance to Spike was found on the kids menu of a Chinese restaurant. Apparently, her name was listed on the menu as Dim Sum, and though she was dubbed a quote-unquote Chinese knockoff Spike by Equestria Daily, it turns out she was actually a stolen OC. Crystal the Dragon was originally posted to DeviantArt several years prior in 2012 by an artist called A Girl 3003. In the original image, her colors appear much brighter taking on a more bluish purple appearance compared to the seafoam and baby pink in the restaurant menu image. Though some people thought that the restaurant intentionally changed her colours to avoid directly copying the stolen art, personally I think the colours just look washed out from being printed onto a faded restaurant menu. Dim Sum went viral after writer M.A. Larson tweeted a photo of her writing, Dim Sum fan art please, if she gets popular enough Hasbro will be forced to put her in the 200th episode. Thankfully, A Girl 3003 took the popularity of Dim Sum in stride, even posting a reference sheet for dim sum with the menu accurate colors for all of those who had become fans of the knockoff character. Number 24, Flurry Heart. Welcome to yet another installment of the Phantom Gets Mad at Hasbro for Selling Out. In this installment, we talk about Flurry Heart, the baby princess. By this point in the video, you get the gist. Creator leaves show. Fans worry that story will be sacrificed for increased toy sales. Q Princess Cadence's Royal Wedding, Twilight's Ascension, and Equestria Girls, all of which confirm those fears. A common accusation leveled at Hasbro was that they were trying to push the idea of alicorn princesses onto the franchise because they thought that the toys sold better with kids. This accusation was not only backed up by the aforementioned Ascension and Royal Wedding, but the fact that there was a certifiable deluge of toys and merchandise. There were wedding dress cadences and princess coronation twilights with crystal castle playsets of course, but weirdly there were also non-canonical alicorns as well. The So Soft newborn line featured a baby alicorn called Princess Twilight and the Rainbow Power and Cutie Mark Magic playful pony sets included two alicorns called Princess Sterling and Princess Gold Lily. So when the season 6 premiere episode The Crystalline came out and revealed that Princess Cadence and Shining Armor now had a pink alicorn princess daughter called Flurry Heart, it just felt like another cheap marketing tactic. Equestria Daily interviewed the supervising director for the episode and asked if all the new alicorns were requested by Hasbro, to which he responded, quote, It's easy to forget that this show primarily exists in order to help market a toy line. So every season, there's usually a few things that the Hasbro brand asks us to include. Previous examples are the helicopter in Testing Testing 123 and the upcoming Swan Boat. There's an instinct to get caught up in an oh man, really kind of attitude, but over the years it becomes somewhat of a fun challenge for us to find ways to incorporate those requests into this series that makes sense in terms of storytelling. And to be fair, the Hasbro brand has been incredibly gracious and patient with how we do that. So, this new alicorn is no different. I seem to recall that this actually came more from a storytelling opportunity rather than exclusive from the Hasbro brand, but they were all excited about the possibility of a new alicorn. As with all of these new characters and idea introductions, it'll be what we do with them beyond their initial appearance. Can we continue these ideas and make them relevant? Make the audience care about this new character? Does this change offer us additional
additional opportunities to tell fun and interesting stories moving forward, which after five seasons can prove to be more difficult than you'd think. And the answer to those questions was... No. Flory Hart's existence was quickly forgotten as she shrunk into a background role, only appearing a few times throughout the course of the rest of the show, mainly as a background cameo. For that reason alone, I kind of call bullshit on the whole it came from a storytelling perspective because... Did it? Did it really? <laughs> She did appear in the Game Loft game with a fully grown up design, which was really cool. I actually really like this design and it's cool that they did that. I really got to talk about the Game Loft game sometime because it's wild. But anyway, aside from that, her appearance in the show did little more than just boost toy sales. Number 25, Boot League Cupcakes Merchandise. Okay, this one isn't really like a brony fandom history moment. It's just really funny and I wanted to bring it up. So according to this tweet, a Boot League My Little Pony backpack was found in Indonesia with stolen vector art of Pinkie Pie, specifically specifically cupcakes Pinkie Pie. Yes, unicorn horn necklace and skin cape and all, this children's bag literally had a serial killer pony on it. The little curtains are sending me. <laughs> you, you, um, you might want to just draw those shut permanently. Number 26, My Little Pony violates the Geneva Convention. Alright, I'm going to ask you a question. If you had to pick a shorthand symbol to represent healthcare or medical services, what symbol would you pick? I'm willing to bet that at least some of you said a red cross, and that's exactly what I would have picked as well, but it turns out that that's actually illegal. According to Rule 59 of the Geneva Convention, quote, the improper use of the distinctive emblems of the Geneva Conventions is prohibited. In 2017, Bronies noticed that a small change had been made to one of the background characters. Nurse Redheart, a nurse pony who works at the hospital, had her cutie mark changed from a large red cross surrounded by hearts to a more subtle white cross with a heart in the middle. This has never been explicitly confirmed by showrunners, but at the time Brony speculated that the character had been changed to avoid any illegal violations of the Geneva Convention, perhaps at the request of the Red Cross themselves. Number 27, Equestria Daily Movie Theatre Etiquette. By late 2017, the My Little Pony movie had begun releasing in theatres and Bronies were hype. To help them have a pleasant movie going experience, Brony news site Equestria Daily published an article titled My Little Pony Movie Theatre Etiquette, aka Don't Be Annoying. Here are just a few of the truly incredible etiquette rules outlined in the article. Stop talking about pony butts. We get it, some of you clop. No one wants to hear about it in public and it's not a funny inside joke kids don't understand. Feel free to do it after the movie in private, but we don't need people whistling every time Rarity flashes a crack. <laughs> Leave the parents and their kids alone. Unless you are approached by them to engage in conversation, please avoid bothering families viewing the movie. A lot of parents aren't even aware the Brony fanbase exists. Friendship may be magic, but most probably don't want a 15 to 30 something butting in on their daughter's Rainbow Dash monologue with how much better Twilight Sparkle is. Don't discuss equestrian economics and law while the movie is playing. I almost think this email was a troll, but it's kind of common sense that no one cares about your theory on Luna's relation to Cadence while watching the movie. Save it for after. And finally, last, but certainly not least, shower beforehand. This goes for conventions too, no one wants to smell you. Even if you think you're fine with a day off in between, do it anyway. I think this comment sums it up best. Number 28, Alicorn Apple Bloom Movie Leaks. Upon the release of the My Little Pony movie, newspapers and media sites began publishing their own reviews, but for some bizarre reason, a huge number of them used this image. Originally posted on DeviantArt by the user Shutterfly EQD, the fan art depicted the characters crowding around Apple Bloom, who was now an alicorn. Hilariously, a lot of publications gave fairly negative and critical reviews of the film, all while using this image that just clearly wasn't actually from the film. Like, did they actually watch it? It's unknown exactly why so many sites use this image, but it's speculated that they were all sharing sources or using the same database for images, and this one was just accidentally placed in there. It's also possible that one article used this image by just Google image searching and using the first thing that came up, and all the other articles just copied their image, thinking it was official somehow. Either way, I'm sure there are at least a few disappointed bronies that went into the movie expecting an alicorn apple bloom story line. Number 29, Rarity and Applejack made canon. In 2019, Equestria Girls came to an end and director Kay Hadley made a tweet thread summarizing and reminiscing about her time on the show. In the replies, a user called at Jumpy Studios asked, quote, what about Rarajack? Was the shipping and rollercoaster of friendship intentional? Is there a possibility they're in love? I never cared for that shit very much before then. For context, in the Equestria Girls episode Rollercoaster of Friendship, there were a lot of shared looks and blushing between the characters that Rarity X Applejack or Rarajack ship is used as evidence
evidence for the ship being canon. In response, Kay Hadley replied, We thought their conflict felt a little like a lover's quarrel rather than a friend fight as was written. So we played it that way but rode the line so the viewer could interpret it as either type of relationship, but internally, yeah, we were rarer jack shipping. After Equestria Daily posted this, it very quickly spread throughout the fandom and if you know anything about fandoms, you know they take shipping very seriously. While some were overjoyed that their ship had been made canon, others argued that Equestria Girls was actually an alternate universe to friendship as magic and thus wasn't canon. Additionally, they said that since it was just staff internally shipping, it was more of a head canon. My opinion? Let the horses be girlfriends. Number 30, Pinkie Pie x Weird Al Cannon. The character Cheese Sandwich made his debut in the season 4 episode Pinkie Pride. In the episode, Pinkie Pie is preparing a birthday party for Rainbow Dash when Cheese Sandwich arrives claiming himself to be Equestria's premier party planner. At first, the two make friends and pair up to throw a truly epic party, but soon Pinkie Pie feels ignored as everyone else shows Cheese Sandwich's ideas and party antics with praise and celebration rather than hers. By the end of the episode, things have gone so badly that she's about to leave town when Cheese Sandwich apologizes to her and admits that he used to be shy and reserved until he stumbled into one of her parties that inspired him to come out of his shell and become a super duper party pony. It's a cute episode and the fans felt that the two characters had a lot of chemistry with tons of shipping art coming out following the episode. There's one other thing I forgot to mention about Cheese Sandwich though. He's Weird Al Yankovic's Pony Sona. Okay, well, not technically, but he's heavily based on and voiced by Weird Al. I mean, come on, look at the hair and the button-up shirt, it's obviously a Sona. This made it all the more hilarious when the show finale came out and it was revealed that Pinkie Pie was married to and had kids with Cheese Sandwich. Following the release of this episode, Weird Al posted a photo of the two on Instagram accompanied by the caption, Lately my timeline has been filled with accusations that I've had sexual relations with a horse. So for the record, I'd just like to State, that's not entirely accurate. Hey, he didn't necessarily say it wasn't true, because it definitely was, and Pinkie Pie canonically marrying and having kids with Weird Al Yankovic is the funniest possible way they could have ended the show, and the funniest possible way that we can close out this list. And that, my friends, was the end of the list. Those were 30 of the most crazy moments from Brony fandom history. Despite the fact that the fandom was filled with drama, despite the fact that it was filled with controversies and infighting and scuffles, despite the fact that it was absolutely unhinged and completely bonkers at the best of times, I still love it. I'll be the first to admit that it was completely cursed, but it brought so many people together from all corners of the globe, doing all kinds of crazy things, from putting ponies in space, to putting ponies in Antarctica, to putting ponies in other things. There were so many genuinely brilliant, kind, welcoming and creative members of the fandom who uplifted each other and made each other feel welcome. To sum everything up, the Brony fandom was a great time and only slightly traumatizing. Thank you guys so much for watching this video, I really hope that you enjoyed it. Um, I've been very excited to bring you yet another uh, tale from the Brony fandom, or in this case 30 different tales from the Brony fandom. Um, they're always a good time to cover, so yeah, definitely let me know down below if there's anything I missed, if there are any crazy moments that were were so big that should have been included on the list but weren't if there's anything that you remember that you want to add to the conversation um yeah just let me know down below i always like reading the comments so definitely share thanks so much to prime gaming for sponsoring this video as well they're super cool definitely go check them out and yeah aside from that i uh, hope you enjoyed the video i hope you have a good one and i hope to see you in the next one bye a huge thank you to my Garth Food Overlords over on Patreon, Oliver Lulz, Carmel Coffee Bean, Blue Mayfeld, Electro Kitten, Katrina Likes Baby Stuff, Fitzy, Jorge K. Cruz, Michelle Olsen, Matt LRJ, SHSL Simpson, Doug, Jordan Nielsen, Dana Home Gardener, Charlie B, Simon, John Leach, Ren Pendragon, Xavier Araujo, Helm Hamburger Hand, Dozo Blint, Sheriff Whiskey, The Furby Librarian, Astrian Vortex, Jesse Chisholm, Fish000, Grip Gunderson, Joe Bradshaw, and Arcantilla. Thank you guys so much for supporting me, um, it means the world to me. If you want to join these guys over on Patreon, uh, head to the link in the description. And yeah, um, thank you guys for watching, I really hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye!